So for LifePoint, it has been a, a challenging year in many respects. Um, we've had a few people in the congregation that uh, received a, a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, we have had a, a family's house burn down. Uh, we had another family's house f flood with sewage because of the uh, hurricane. Um, we watch the news, so outside of our church, there's been terrible news. Uh, for example, this Sunday afternoon, I turned on my computer to find out that a deranged individual broke into a church in Texas and shot 26 people. That was terrible. And then last Sunday evening, and JJ alluded to this a little bit, we lost one of our dear sisters, Elizabeth Landazuri. Many of you knew her. Many of you knew her very well. She was one of the leaders of our women's ministry. Uh, she worked in the children's ministry. Uh, she was the director of the care ministry. I mean, it's been kind of a tough year. And the truth is there's no shortage of tragedy in the world. Whether or not you knew Elizabeth, whether or not you know any of the people here at LifePoint that difficult things have happened to, you look in the world, you look at the, uh, you watch the news, and you hear people talk, and you're like, man, this is difficult. For the world, these tragedies produce a lot of questions, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration and a lot of resentment. I mean, people outside of the church look at these tragedies, look at these shootings, look at this destruction, and it makes them angry, rightly so. But for Christians, these tragedies also create anger. We're susceptible to the same feelings as the world, right? We... we we have questions, we have frustration, in some cases maybe even resentment. For the world, frustration and anger about tragedy and loss has very little focus. And if you, if you notice, when the world is going through a tragedy, they tend to focus their anger and frustration on each other especially after this situation last week where the shooter showed up in a church, you've got one side of the political fence blaming the other side of the political fence and vice versa. In issues that have happened uh, throughout this country, you have one race blaming another race and then another race blaming them back and back and forth. My point is, for the world, frustration is focused on each other. But for Christians, our anger and frustration has a different focus. And if we're going to be honest this morning, our anger and frustration is often aimed at God. Because we know that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and it creates like this tension. Because it doesn't always make sense to serve an all-loving, all-knowing, all-benevolent um, God when tragedy strikes. Do you see the tension? Like, wait a minute, God, aren't you paying attention? So we question our faith. We question God. And I want to tell you this morning, that's natural, it's normal, and it's healthy. Dare I say, it's biblical. Many heroes of the Bible had many questions for God in his dealings. The challenge is this, for the world, for those outside of the church, for those who are not following Jesus, what they try to do is manage their anger, manage their frustration. There's another word for that, it's coping. That's how they deal with tragedy, they cope with tragedy. But I want to encourage you, for believers, we have far more than coping. We don't cope, we hope. Hoping is far better than coping. So today, I want to share with you three reasons why hoping 
is better than coping. Coping looks inward. Hoping looks upward. What do I mean by that? See, coping is just doing your best to manage the pain, the loss, and the frustration, but many times it's a solitary process. You may have dealt with this, maybe a loss in your family, maybe a loved one, maybe a child, maybe it's a a, a job loss, maybe it's an important relationship, a friendship. And in the world, the best they can do is try to cope with it. But I want to tell you that hope comes from somewhere else. If you look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 17, in your Bible, I'll read it to you, these seven verses. It says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Have you ever felt that way? So I say my endurance has perished, so my hope from the Lord Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. This is an individual who is struggling to cope. Verse 20 says, or excuse me, verse 21. But this I call to mind and therefore I have what? Hope. Hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Just like the song we sung this morning. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. For the author of Lamentations, he's utterly despondent. He says, my soul is empty. I've forgotten how to be happy. My endurance is perished. But then he remembers and realizes that his answer is not in himself. It's not in that happiness. It's not in endurance. It is from God. And it's interesting what can happen when we put our trust in God instead of ourself. When we sort of take ourself out of the driver's seat and allow God to drive. Kind of reminds me of that bumper sticker that you see. God is my co-pilot. Inaccurate. If God is your co-pilot, you need to do this. Switch places. Actually, I saw this bumper sticker the other day, and it's actually probably more accurate. God is my co-pilot. He steers while I text. (laughs) That's how it goes a lot of times. But here's the challenge. It's not easy to give up the driver's seat in your life. It's not easy to turn from our finite answers to God's infinite solution. What helps is coming to grips with the fact that our understanding is limited, but his understanding is limitless. Faith is a matter of certainty. So here's my second point. Coping says, I guess. Hoping says, I know. Everybody say, I know. know. Now say it like you know. I know. See, we often use the words hope and wish interchangeably. Like we say, oh, I wish I could go swimming, or I hope I can go swimming. Do you see how it sort of seems, I don't really want to go swimming. I was just trying to think of a good example. But do you understand? I wish that we could have some dessert. I hope there'll be dessert. They're kind of interchangeable, but they're not the same thing. Not as far as the Bible is concerned. Now let's go back to the Bible, to the book of Hebrews. We're going to go into the New Testament. I'll give you plenty of time to find it. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews is right before the book of James. This is a great Bible passage. It's one that I would recommend you at least underline, if not memorize. Here's what it says. Now, faith is the assurance of things, what? Hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
In the NIV, the word assurance is translated as conviction. In the Holman Christian Bible, the word assurance is translated as reality. It's interesting because the Greek word is hypostasis, and that comes from the word hypo, which means under, or like hypo, under, and stasis, which means foundation. So the idea is this is about a, a strong foundation, something that you can place your belief on. Definition for faith hinges on expectation, sort of a certain reality. So faith is about knowing what's going to happen in the future. See, coping says, I wish for a better tomorrow, but hope says, I know there's a better tomorrow. No matter what I feel now, no matter how confused I am about the world, no matter how discouraged I am when I see tragedy and disaster and pain and death, I know there's a better tomorrow. Coping says, I wonder if it will, work all, it will all work out. Hope says, I'm confident it will. So it's a good time to ask you, are you stuck in a coping mode or are you in a hoping mode? Basically, I'm asking, do you say, I guess it will be okay? I think it will be okay? Or do you know it will be okay? The difference is whether you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the hope. We'll come back to that. My third point, coping is for now. Hoping is forever. Coping is for now. Hoping is forever. See, when it comes to the world, most of what I've seen regarding coping with tragedy is about getting by, getting through, one day at a time. Now, there's some truth to the one day at a time thing. Even the Bible says you shouldn't worry about tomorrow. But what's missing from coping is the incredible promise of the future. Let's go to one more Bible passage today, this time in the book of Ephesians. If you were at Hebrews, you're going to go back towards the front of your Bible and you'll find the book of Ephesians. This was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians just like yourselves who needed to be encouraged about their future. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. This is an incredible reassurance here for the believer. Even in the midst of tragedy and sadness, those who hope in Christ have already obtained an inheritance, basically a guarantee that God will provide everything you need. See, your outlook tends to change when you know your future is secure. A story from Parade Magazine. Um, well, there's a story that was shared about a guy named Eugene Land. He changed the lives of a sixth grade class in East Harlem. He was asked to go speak to these uh, 59 sixth graders. He was a multimillionaire. And when he went into the class, he wondered what he could say to try to inspire these students to be successful, most of whom would drop out of school statistically. Most of the kids looked at him, not too interested, and he finally decided to scrap his notes and speak to them from the heart. And this is what he said, stay in school and I'll help pay the college tuition for every one of you. No, excuse me, I will pay the college tuition for every one of you. Stay in school, and I'll pay your tuition. So to 59 sixth graders, he decided he would pay their college tuition. At that moment, the lives of the students changed, the article says. For the first time, they had hope. Said one student, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. Out of that class of 59 sixth graders, all but five of them graduated. It defied the statistics. Speaking of the future, let me say this. We know our future is secure, and for believers, that means a lot, especially in the face of losing someone we love. 
having that kind of hope gives you an immense um, sense of relief when it comes to saying goodbye because the truth is when you're a believer you never have to say goodbye you only say see you soon if you're a believer you never have to say goodbye you say see you soon i'll put this verse up on the screen this is first thessalonians 4 13 there was a church in thessalonica in the first century who had lost some of the ones they loved and paul reassures them by saying this we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. See, that's another problem with the world, is they really don't have the hope in the future to see the ones they've lost. Maybe you've lost somebody close to you recently. Maybe you've wondered if you'd ever see them again. If you're a believer and they're a believer, you'll spend eternity together with them. And let me tell you something. There is a big difference between losing somebody in the world and losing somebody in the church. I've been around a lot of grief, and I've been around a lot of death. I've been the chaplain here in Longwood and Lake Mary for the last 10 years. I've seen the difference between a group of people that grieve with no hope and a group of people that grieve with hope. It's night and day, literally. And folks who don't believe, folks who don't believe in Jesus, they just don't get it. And it's because they have no sense of a guaranteed inheritance, of a preferred future. And that may lead them to challenge your faith, try to paint you into a theological corner, so to speak. I have a friend who doesn't believe, and he says, you know, it doesn't make sense to me because, okay, so if somebody get sick, and you pray like crazy that they'll get better, and then they do get better, you say, God answered our prayer. And then if somebody gets sick, and you pray like crazy for them to get better, and they don't get better, but instead they die, you say, well, God chose not to answer our prayer. He had a better plan. And my friend says, that's not fair. God can't lose that way. You understand that? To his logic, it's not right because God's always going to win there. He's always going to come out on top. Well, let me say two things. Number one, do you want to serve a God that can lose? I mean, where, like, where my logic is concerned, like my logic says, well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, is it a cop-out? I mean, God, if we pray and, and this person gets better, then obviously you answered a prayer. If we pray and the person doesn't get better, then did you ignore us or did, did you just decide to do something different? If we say it's God's will, then, well, he can't lose. I don't know about you, but I don't want to serve a God that can lose a, a logical debate to me. I can't even solve a Rubik's Cube. And you don't want to serve a God that can lose a logic debate to you. Here is the thing. It only looks that way to the skeptic and to the world because their vantage point is so limited. It's right here and it's right now. Of course it looks terrible right now. Of course it looks um, tragic. Because... We don't see the future. God sees the future. He knows all. His vantage point is without limits of space and time and understanding. So somehow, he knows what to do, even if it's difficult for us, even if it's challenging, even if it's heartbreaking. I want to serve a God who's willing to allow what is best in this world even if it seems tragic for a time, knowing that he has the full picture. Don't forget how big God is. The Bible says that God measured the ocean in the palm of his hand. It says he used his hand to measure the universe. Now, that's poetic language, but it's only poetic because God's 
bigger than that. That's the God I want to serve. And our faith is about trusting God and knowing that he knows when to intervene in our lives and when not to. Hey, is that easy? No. That's not easy. It's not easy to have that kind of faith. It's not easy to trust God. And let me, let me tell you this. The people in the Bible, they struggled with it too. As a matter of fact, I would say just about all the people in the Bible struggled with that. Habakkuk said to God, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save me. How applicable is that to our culture today when a madman guns down 26 people in the church? God, when are you going to put an end to this? David said, my enemies rise against me. God, please deliver me. He said that not once, but for about 30 chapters of the Bible straight. John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, was imprisoned and sent word to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, are you the one? Will I live? Will I die? What happened to John the Baptist? He lost his head. He was killed. He was executed. Sometimes God chooses not to intervene. And so if you're struggling between coping and hoping, I just want you to know you're in good company. Now, when you think of all of these ideas, coping looks inward, hoping looks upward, coping says I guess, hoping says I know, coping is for now, hoping is forever. Let me make my last point. Coping is just about surviving, but hoping is about thriving. Hoping is about living. Let me share a couple of things as I close. Number one, hope doesn't eliminate grief. That doesn't mean you don't feel sad. If you lose somebody in the next month or year, you're going to feel sad. Even Jesus felt sad when he lost his friend Lazarus, even when he knew he would bring him back to life. As a believer, you're not immune to loss. And the other thing is, and I wish I could say like, okay, as I close this message, let me give you three steps to help you move from just coping to hoping, but it's not, it's not that kind of a thing. Everybody takes this journey individually, but, or excuse me, everybody takes this journey differently, but as we walk through this journey differently, we do walk through this journey together. That's maybe the one key that's important to share. The last thing I want to mention is We did lose a dear sister, Elizabeth Landazuri, this week, and it's been very challenging for a lot of people. And as a church, being a, a church of 15 years, this is the first time this kind of thing has happened, where somebody so young, so integral to the church, uh, died tragically, unexpectedly. And Elizabeth was in charge of our care ministry, and several times a week she would post a Bible verse in our LifePoint Care Ministry Facebook page. And let me share the last verse that she posted before she passed away. It's from the book of Hebrews. I'll put it up on the screen. She posted this from Hebrews 10. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the what? Hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. That is so powerful. God can be trusted to keep his promise. We walk through this together. The very next two verses after this verse says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. We don't walk this journey alone. We walk it together as a family, as the body of Christ. Christ.